There's a very scary warning coming from the former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, vis-a-vis China and Russia and us, which has you wondering, what are the Democrats doing here? Why is Ed Markey, the Democrat from Massachusetts, leading a delegation to Taiwan just after Nancy Pelosi? Whose idea is this anyway? Do we really want to be getting into such a confrontation which could lead to some really bad stuff? I'll get into what Henry Kissinger told the Wall Street Journal in just a second. At this point in time, I mean, it just feels like we're making mistake after mistake after mistake on the international policy front. You saw what happened in Afghanistan. Now we got Nancy Pelosi hanging out in Taipei, and now the the new group led by Markey, I mean... I'm not sure that anybody knows what they're doing. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Trish Regan Show. If you have not downloaded this podcast on Apple iTunes, please make sure that you do. Today's broadcast is brought to you by Legacy Precious Metals. There's never been a better time to invest in precious metals than right now, so go to LegacyPMInvestments.com for more. Again, LegacyPMInvestments.com. We're going to talk some more about the economy, including this news that the housing market may, in fact, already be in a recession. This is according to to some new data points that are out. Hard to believe, right? Hard to believe, given that home prices are still incredibly strong, incredibly high, which is partly the problem surrounding all this inflation. But back to what Kissinger is saying and what the Democrats are doing. According to Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State, really, really brilliant guy, 99 years old. He's actually out with a brand new book. He sat down and told the Wall Street Journal that America is on edge of war with Russia and China. And he seems to be pointing the finger, although he's doing it in a very diplomatic way, not totally pointing the finger, but suggesting that American politicians really are at fault in that they're so governed by emotion and they're so governed by sort of the cultural values that are important to us that they're not able to really see a long-term play with some countries that we seem to be at odds with. A little more complicated than that, and, and we will get into it. But before I do, can I ask why Nancy Pelosi went there, really? I mean, I suspect that someone had the bad idea, maybe somebody in the State Department, maybe, who knows, maybe it was Antony Blinken. I don't know. But somebody had the bad idea that she should go over there right now because we're trying to send the message that we're going to protect Taiwan. Of course, we got a lot of semiconductor companies over there. Maybe we should have thought some of that stuff through right before outsourcing all of our important technology to a place like Taiwan, which has been able to manufacture this stuff very efficiently, very cheaply. I'm happy that Intel is bringing one of its major facilities back here on shore to Ohio, but we've got some pretty important stuff over there and thus an important relationship and thus we need to protect it. And China, well, they feel like Taiwan's theirs. So Nancy Pelosi went over there. It caused a big stir. China was really upset. But now we're doubling down on this. Like I said, it could have been a mistake. Somebody threw out the idea and she thought, okay, sure, I'll go. And so she committed to going. And once she commit to going, well, at that point, when China comes out and says, you can't go, you have to go, right? Like you you don't have a choice at that point. You're not going to be bossed around by China. So she had to follow through. She had to go. And I, at the time, thought, well, maybe it was just some very poorly thought out planning, right? Like, frankly, no planning. I mean, extremely poorly thought out. But now they're doubling down. Now you've got the Democrat from Massachusetts leading a congressional delegation as we speak. The Chinese, understandably, are totally furious. They're making all kinds of threats as these five lawmakers now led by Markey, are in Taiwan. So now China is responding to this surprise arrival with military drills, right? Because they got to do something. They've got to show their strength. We're sending our people over there. It's turning into kind of a mess. And I'm going to go back to this. I'm not confident in the State Department's ability to digest to understand and to follow through on policies that make sense for our country. 
I mean, historically, Democrats were the ones that really didn't want to get into any kind of conflict, right? And yet you look at what's been happening and you say, well, what's really at play here? I mean, I don't think this wins any political favors, so let's, let's count that one out. They may say, listen, we got to do something about China, but I, I kind of prefer the tariffs route, let me just say, as opposed to the let's confront them head on by sending delegations to Taiwan and potentially getting ourselves into a military conflict. You've heard me say before, and I'll say it again, I would much rather lose dollars any day of the week than lives. And this is why we should be thoughtful about the policy choices that we make because we don't want to wind up in a situation that we don't want to be in. Let me go back to what Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State, this would be under President Richard Nixon, has been saying, and, and I'll quote, he said, all you can do is not accelerate the tensions and to create options. And for that, you have to have some purpose. He's suggesting that we don't have enough purpose and that we do not have enough of a game plan because everybody's so darn political in this country. That's our problem. And every single thing that comes along, it's used and manipulated for political purposes. And so how can we think long-term about a strategy? How can we think about geopolitical stability when we're always using it for some reason or another? It's one of the reasons why I think you do have to protect yourself and your family with your investments, and gold is one of those ways to do it. One of our sponsors on the program, of course, is Legacy Precious Metals, and you've heard me talk about gold a lot. Silver, they handle silver as well. I don't want to ignore silver because so many of you actually really like silver, and um, it, silver's considered maybe a little bit more volatile but has potentially some more upside in it, so I'm not ignoring silver, but I do. I mean, I've always really liked gold as one of those Things in one's portfolio, not a huge percentage. I mean, it's anywhere from 1% to 5% is sort of the rule of thumb, depending on your uh, ability to tolerate risk. But having that there can help to even out some of the fluctuations, both in the market and then the geopolitical instability that you may be seeing right now. And of course, hopefully help preserve your savings for the future as we look at eight and a half percent inflation, right? I mean, eight and a half percent and the administration is excited. I'm sorry. It's uh, still eight and a half percent year over year. And even if it were two percent, like best case scenario, we had two percent inflation, which is super low. Look still at the, the the increase in overall inflation over time in that your dollar's even when they're just losing 2% a year, they're worth less. So if you just save them and you're trying to do the right thing and you're, you know, you're saving them or stuffing them under the mattress and, and think that those dollars are going to be able to buy you the same standard of living in the future, you're wrong. And that's why people look at things like gold-backed IRAs, Legacy Precious Metals. That's the company I trust for this. LegacyPMInvestments.com is their website. You can check them out there. Again, LegacyPMInvestments.com or give them a ring. You're, you're welcome to say that I sent you or that you I recommended it. They are my friends over there. And they can help you out. 1-866-589-0560. one 589 But we've got all this international turmoil going on. We've got inflation going on. And then what do you know? We've got the prospect of a potential recession in housing. I mean, you think to yourself, how can that even be possible right now, given how on fire this, this housing market really has been? And yet, some of the recent data, uh, both in terms of home affordability, and then now what you're seeing in terms of sentiment suggests that we're heading for a more challenging time, as we should. I mean, look, these things are cyclical, and you can't have something going up, 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 and away forever. I mean, you, you've seen... That, that it's hard to actually get a house um, because the prices now have gone so high. And, and now some are suggesting that, in fact, we are in what you might call a housing recession. This is what home builders are saying. In fact, confidence among builders in that U.S. housing market has actually plunged to the lowest level that we've seen really since, I mean, you're going to go back to March 2020. Of course, they could be totally wrong. I mean, look at what happened after March 2020. The housing market went totally on fire. But this is the National Association of Home Builders, Wells Fargo Housing Market Index, and it measures kind of the pulse of the single-family housing market to see what the sentiment is for that. 
and it fell for the eighth straight consecutive month down to 49, which is actually, uh, you know, the worst stretch that we've seen for housing since 2008. Any reading above 50 is consider- considered positive when you're at 49, that's considered negative. And so we may be heading into more challenging times for housing. Without a doubt, there are significant risks ahead. It's, it's one of the reasons why Jamie Dimon, per Business Insider, who reported on this over the weekend, last weekend, is telling clients, some private clients, look, we could be in for something that's much worse than a recession. I mean, we really, really don't know. We just don't know because this is so unprecedented. When the Democrats try and tell us that we're not in a recession, I first of all just want everybody to remember what the classic definition of a recession is, two quarters of negative growth. And we are in that right now. No recession is exactly like the other one. And so when I look at all that's going on, I'm troubled and perplexed by the buoyancy in the job market. I mean, to have unemployment as low as it is right now is a little bit bizarre, right? So you say, what's what's really going on? I suspect a lot of people are still not in the labor market. They found alternatives after March 2020, and they're sticking with those alternatives. So wages are going to continue accelerating. I like that. Actually, that's good. They're just not accelerating fast enough because you got prices on everything else going up. And that in is the root of the problem. And I don't think entirely fixable by the Federal Reserve in the near future. So even though the market's been doing really well as of late, I'm still nervous about where we are and not convinced that we're out of the woods. So I'll leave you with that. Remember, don't forget to subscribe to the Apple iTunes version of this podcast. It's so important that you do. I'm here every single day for you for free well, free for you. And and I want you to download that. I want you to tell your friends, get the word out. It's so important. It's so important right now. We got lots coming our way and I want you to be able to hear and understand and synthesize what's real. I'll see you back here tomorrow.